Welcome to the last Accuracy in Academia Authors' Night of the summer of 2013. We do these to enable you to see speakers with insights and information you're not likely to get on a college campus or in a congressional hearing for that matter. We are able to do this through a grant, can you still hear me, from the Frank A. and Nellie Galetti Fusco Foundation, which has generously supported all of our Accuracy in Academia Conservative University lectures. Our speaker tonight has attempted a daunting task and startlingly succeeded. She has tried to recover, and we're in danger of losing a lot of our history, about half a century of Cold War history, the second half of the 20th century, in a terrific book entitled American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. She shows how we actually won the Cold War but tried to keep it a secret, and even helped the other side through generosity or cupidity. That remains to be seen. At any rate, she is authoritative, informative, impressive, and I'm going to stop at three adjectives. Ladies and gentlemen, Diana West. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm, I'm very glad to be addressing you tonight and the Accuracy in Academia program. I've always been a great fan. It's so important. There's very little accuracy in academia, and I can say that after having gone through this, this research and found this, what, what Mel is talking about is lost history, which is a very accurate way of describing it. But I'd like to begin by warning everyone that this book actually asks a lot of readers in terms of rethinking what we know about our past. It argues that much of what we know about ourselves as a country is, in fact, a series of big lies. We usually associate big lies with totalitarian systems, with Stalin, with Hitler. But we tell them, too. Now, some of these are very easy to spot because we've discarded them, and we know that they are lies now. For example, the, the big lie that Uncle Joe Stalin was a great guy. This was a big lie that our government told us during World War II. Uncle Joe, of course, being the nickname that Roosevelt and Churchill gave to, to Stalin, one of the great or the cruelest mass murderers of all time during World War II. This is what they called him. Um, another big lie was that communism was all right, was very compatible with democracy. This was something else that our government told us, especially during World War II. And even we get down to some nitty gritty lies, such as very specific lies, uh, as when Franklin Roosevelt in 1941 declared to the American people that there was freedom of religion in the Soviet Union as guaranteed by the Soviet Constitution, which another big lie. Now, other big lies are easy to spot, even though we still tell them. And I would offer as an example of that one, Islam is a religion of peace. Um, we get hit on 9-11, and the president and the government from that day forward tell us Islam is a religion of peace, and every fact or discussion that is really permissible or supported or promoted in the public square is supposed to support this statement. It's an illogical statement. It's, it's not only illogical, as I came to think of it, it's actually an ideological statement. It's, it's a theory for political purposes, and the facts are being marshaled in support of that ideology. And when I, I actually began this book trying to understand that particular big lie in a better way, to understand how it could be that we could be telling this lie, um, why it was so impossible for society to face up to just facts about Islamic history, facts about the condition of non-Muslims under Islamic law, facts about uh, what jihad means for non-Islamic societies, and so on. These were the sorts of, of concerns that I was, was understanding, treating, discovering, reading about as a journalist. I write a weekly newspaper column, and at the time I was actually on the Washington Times editorial page, of time of 9-11 that is, 
And so this was, um, you know, I was coming to these issues along with, with most other Americans who were not familiar with Islam. And I remember just finding disconnect after disconnect in terms of well, the research I was doing and what I was hearing in the rest of the media or certainly on Capitol Hill and, and from the White House and, and so on. So those were the subjects that I actually began with. And I, when I decided to turn to a book form, I was interested in finding out whether there was precedent for this kind of um, institutional failure of society to confront this kind of a, a threat to our system, to liberty. And was there precedent for telling these kinds of lies, for the government to be telling these kinds of lies in society? And at a certain point, I realized that what I was looking at was actually almost an inversion of logic as much as um, a loss of courage. In other words, to insist that Islam is a religion of peace is to be illogical. It is to be ideological. And if you did not follow along, you would be tagged an Islamophobe. And this was something, again, I'm watching, I'm listening, I'm reading, I'm writing every week. Um, and this is where I started linking back to the past, because the word Islamophobe today is very much like the word red baiter several generations ago. What does it do? It stops conversation cold. It, it puts the, the person who is raising an issue on the defensive, and there's no more discussion or debate. There's only defensiveness. And this is, this is where you see the linkage. And I wanted to read you something that J.B. Matthews, who is an ex-socialist of, of note in the middle of the, the 20th century, um, what he wrote in 1938 about red baiting he described red baiting as the best trick ever invented short of a firing squad for making short work of anybody who dares to object to communist theories and practices. If he is not effectively silenced, he is at least thoroughly discredited among the vast flock of citizens who enjoy thinking of themselves as liberals. Here is where I found the common thread, ideology. Islam, while it is a religion, is to be sure a totalitarian and collectivist ideology. Communism, while it is not a religion, it does inspire religious devotion among many of its followers. And it is also a totalitarian and collectivist ideology. Both of these systems are at odds with rule of law based liberty. Now, not to acknowledge these plain facts about these two systems is actually serves both of these ideologies. It, it helps them uh, find acceptance, accommodation in the ho our society. Now, w when I started going back in time, I began to discover, much to my amazement, that these sorts of patterns I was finding in, again, in, with this would be the Bush to Obama administration period, you could find parallels back in the day, back in the days of World War II, when we see the US government embarking on a campaign to whitewash communism. This whitewash of communism, I was not familiar with. And I found these, again, these parallels with this whitewash of Islam. And you start looking at it, and you start realizing, again, that it's really um, more of a cover-up of reality to serve an ideolog ideological end. And now this is where. I started getting the thematic structure, with the word cover-up, of, of, of reality, the thematic structure of, of what became this book. I began to realize that the past century was less the, str the struggle between communism and the free world, or communism and capitalism. I began to see more and more this pattern of the struggle between um, cover-up of conspiracy and exposure. So the impulse to hide versus the forces of exposure. And this, to me, became a new way to frame much of the 20th century American experience. You see this tension, certainly, in Washington, DC. And at this point, I would like to, um, if you will indulge me, read a paragraph of this book. Um, it is the first paragraph. It's from the introduction, which is called The Beginning. And again, I think this, this sets the, the structure of this notion of conspiracy and exposure. And I also find it interesting to read, since we are so close to Union Station, which is actually what I'm describing. It, it always gives me chills at this point to go through Union Station after I've, after I've uh, done this research. Here's why. Sometime in 1934, 
two men got off separate trains at Union Station in Washington, D.C. They had arrived in the nation's capital to fight on different sides of a war. It was a war few Americans knew, or even now know, was raging all around the capital. One man in his early 30s had come to expand the reach of the secret communist apparatus already entrenched inside the U.S. government. The other man, age 60, had come to expose it. The name of the younger man was Whitaker Chambers. Later, he would become the most famous ex-communist to bear witness to the conspiracy he had served. The older man, William A. Wirt, would die in obscurity. What happened to William Wirt was, of course, Whitaker Chambers went off and was un unknown to anyone for, for many years. About 14 years came between that point and when he would later testify in the very famous hearings in 1948, the Hiss Chambers hearings, which many of you have probably heard of. The older man who was coming here was here to testify on the Hill in the same room that Chambers actually would, would testify in years later about a dinner party he had been to in the Washington area at the end of 1933. And it's kind of an amazing thing to think you'd have congressional hearings about a dinner party. However, the conversation that he had witnessed had to do with New Dealers discussing the subversion of America, the end of the Constitution, the, the, the um, plans to collectivize uh, the economy, the, the, or control the economy, collectivize various aspects of it. And he was so alarmed that he had written these letters uh, about what he'd heard to everyone he could possibly think of, newspapers, famous people. One of them uh, was a very famous industrialist of the day who was able to, um, he was actually testifying on the Hill himself in some of the um, Wall Street or the economic hearings that were going on to reshaping Wall Street in the New Deal. And he, he read the letter into the congressional record, just all of it. And it started this incredible um, controversy that actually was a national news story these hearings were devised by the Democratic majority not to uncover or find out about what Wirt had heard, but to shut it down, to suppress it. And indeed, he would be essentially, it was a very small committee, it was three Democrats, two Republicans, and uh, what went, basically they didn't allow him to speak, cross-examine witnesses, call witnesses. In other words, it was essentially, a, I consider it the very first American show trial. And we know so much about the backstory of it now because one of those Democrats, some years later, actually wrote a public mea culpa apologizing to now the, the late Dr. Wirt um, about having turned the screws on Dr. Wirt, set the witness story so that everyone just essentially said he was um, an old windbag who, who spoke the whole night. No one could possibly have been plotting revolution. He never got a word in edgewise. Um, he explained this in, a, in, a, in an article, or it was a letter he wrote that was published in many newspapers, not Washington newspapers, but across the country. And then if we flash forward again, we know, because of various um, releases in secret archives, both in Moscow and in America, but we know that three of the six other din dinner guests were actually Soviet agents or collaborators people who appear in the KGB records that became known after the fall of the Soviet Union in, 19, in 1991. So it, you can look back and see that Dr. Wirt was trying to expose something that was going on in the Capitol. He was shut down. He was tremendously discouraged and disheartened by his own experience. Um, and then we find out years later not only did one of the Democrats confess to what had been going on in terms of they didn't want to block the politics of the New Deal, they didn't want to have this kind of revelation. And then we find out, yes, actually, he was listening to revolution being plotted, being talked about, for sure. Three of the six people were actually KGB assets and agents. So this is what's going on in that period. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, well, who won? Did we have the forces of exposure win or the fo forces of suppression? And I would have to argue that the forces of concealment won. Um, I think it's quite clear that the communist conspirators won in terms of keeping the extent and implications of this penetration still a secret from us, really. I mean, we, we know about these various revelations now that come out of the archives, but we haven't connected them to our historical understanding. 
And I think that one way um, that helps illustrate this is, for example, people have prob everyone has heard of Alger Hiss in the room, the famous communist agent. He was a State Department official who was later unmasked as a very important communist agent. Um, he started the UN. He fostered the development of the UN. He was the American political official, the government official, who was uh, guiding the development of the UN. We don't usually connect the UN with a Soviet agent. We don't connect the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. Those big shiny buildings in downtown Washington, we don't usually look at those and connect those with the fact that they were fostered into existence by another Soviet agent, Harry Dexter White, who was a senior official at the Treasury Department uh, in those war years and, and was able to get this uh, set up. We don't connect the impact of that penetration to the formation of our modern world. So this is part of the reason why this, these kinds of questions, these are not just historical curiosities or interesting discoveries from the old records. We are still living with this, and it still shapes where we are. Um, it's, it, you know, in a sense, we can say our enemies designed our modern world. And of course, I would just add, you know, especially because there are young people in the room who are still in college, anyone who goes to college believing in free markets and liberty unless they're very lucky and where they go to school is going to, at a certain point, realize that their campus very often seems to be an outpost of Marx. I mean, it's just, it's just is what happens to us. Um, how can we say we won the Cold War with these kinds of developments in our midst? We don't think about it that way. But I think we have to get through some of the uh, PR about, about who we are and where we are. And this is what I try to do in the book. And along the way, I have a lot of help from uh, characters in our past that I, I started just calling the truth tellers. They are the witnesses, they are the, the ex-conspirators uh, who came out, the great witnesses who left communism and would testify, such as Whitaker Chambers. Another one would be Elizabeth Bentley, another uh, former communist agent who broke and provided uh, the FBI with something like 140 names of secret agents working for the other side, agents and collaborators working against the Constitution, working against our government, working to benefit Moscow. I mean, this is not just people with different points of view about you know, how to uh, go forward in the um, American system. These are people who wanted to change or, or overthrow the American system. So this is the kind of conflict we're talking about. And you look back at Elizabeth Bentley and you think, why doesn't she have a statue at Vassar, which is where she went to college, for example? I mean, it, it, you laugh, but I mean, it's the kind of thing where if you were actually recognizing a contribution of a famous alumna, you would do that just as Yale has a statue to Nathan Hale. Um, but we don't even think that way because we haven't restored, I don't believe, I argue, we haven't restored logic and, and honesty to our record. And so this is the kind of thing I'm, I'm trying to work with in the book always finding these people smeared, um, always finding the William Wirtz, the Elizabeth Bentleys. Um, I'll mention another truth teller that I was very impressed with, uh, George Racy Jordan, Major George Racy Jordan, who during World War II was the, um, they called him the, the expediter, the lead expediter of material and war material, munitions, planes, all manner of supplies that went from the United States through to the Soviet Union. And he was the lead expediter at this huge air base in Montana that uh, was set up for this purpose. And he got on to the fact at a certain point and would testify after the war that he had actually expedited uranium, heavy water, and over a hundred other atomic materials to the Soviet Union during World War II when our greatest secret was the Manhattan Project. I mean, this was not supposed to be going on. Now, he was following orders and he was doing his job. It wasn't that he was out of line and he certainly didn't know he was doing anything wrong because this was such a big secret and he didn't know what uranium was. Nobody knew. But he actually testified in 1949 and again in 1950 about his experiences. And the, the hearings were actually called something like, you know, it, hearings into the transfer of atomic materials to the Soviet Union. And I'm reading about this, I'm reading the hearings, I'm reading uh, Major Jordan's memoir, which is a very important <coughs> book. 
And I'm wondering, why haven't I ever heard of this before? Where did this history go? This man testified there were five essential points to what he was bringing forth to the Congress after, and the, the, the hearings were essentially in response to the fact that the Soviet Union exploded their own atomic bomb, which was a hugely shocking, disturbing moment in American history. We had the monopoly on, on the atomic bomb, and then all of a sudden, in, I think it's 1949, the Soviet Union exploded their atomic bomb, and this was a very destabil destabilizing moment. And indeed, we find out later, again, from these archives, that the, the possession of the bomb actually enabled and encouraged Stalin to uh, essentially trigger support the Korean War, support North Korea's war on South Korea, we're looking at millions of people who died and, and scores of thousands, you know, I can't remember the number, but many, many tens of thousands of Americans who died in that war as well as many other people. How many? 38, 38 thank you, 38,000. In other words, the possession of the bomb essentially led directly into this particular um, act of aggression. So it's a very important um, question, how did that happen? How did that happen? Many of us, have, probably most of us in the room have heard of the Rosenbergs, the atomic spy ring that they were involved in. They weren't alone. They were, they, this was not just their deal. And when you look at Jordan's testimony, four out of his five points that he was bringing to the Congress, they could actually document with things like bills of lading and airplane numbers and various people step forward to corroborate uh, what he was saying. The fifth claim, was something that he witnessed alone. It was a telephone call. And it was a telephone call that he said came from Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins, what, I don't know if, has anyone heard of Harry Hopkins in the room? But none of, none of our, our young friends. It's not your fault. Harry Hopkins disappeared from American history almost the day he died. He died in 1946. He was after the president, after President Roosevelt, he was the most important man in America. He was President Roosevelt's top advisor. He was so top, he was so close. He lived in the White House for three and a half years. He lived in the family quarters of the White House. He did not have confirmation. He did not have any specific uh, role. He just was the right hand of, in fact, he was very often called the co-president. He was that important. People said, you know, there were tons of stories written about him at the time. They said, you know, you can't get anything done in Washington without Harry Hopkins initialing it. it he was that important, but he disappeared from the record, which I find very um, interesting and, and kind of fits into some of my, my, um, my theories, you know, in terms of why someone that important would disappear. But he, there's a great controversy about him to this day as to whether he was a Soviet agent. Is it possible that the president was relying on a Soviet agent? The evidence begins with a um, KGB agent who had been working for the British for some years who came out and wrote a memoir with uh, um, an intelligence expert named Christopher Andrew. They wrote a book called KGB in 1990. And this intelligence agent, his name is Gordievsky, actually spoke about being a young KGB officer in the Soviet Union, being lectured by a great spy master of theirs who actually told the class that of the, all the agents, the greatest American agent was Harry Hopkins. So you have to wonder, is this true? Can this be possibly true? There's a lot of um, discussion of this in the book, various uh, pieces of the Harry Hopkins story, but the one I would leave you with, just in terms of the truth tellers. This man, Jordan, who's a great witness, we have much of his, his um, information corroborated. His story of, of personal witness to Harry Hopkins, what I consider Harry Hopkins' perfidy, was he got a phone call from Harry Hopkins at some point in 1943, early 1943, telling him, you're going to get a shipment of chemicals coming through here. This is out in Montana. I want you to kind of push it through on the QT, I, you know, quietly. Just get it through, and, you know, we need to get it out. And sure, aye, aye, boss. I mean, there was no reason to question Harry Hopkins. He was the president's top guy, and he was the man behind this whole Lend-Lease program. Later on, and through various um, uh, study and 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 uh, examination, Major Jordan realized he'd been he pushed through uranium, and this is what he testified to. And we can prove he pushed uranium through. We can prove the shipment. We cannot prove anything. We just have Jordan's word about this phone call. However, his word is pretty good, given that the rest of his record is provable. But the point of this 
particular action, the point of the fact that Lend-Lease program did indeed push through uranium through the Soviet Union becomes very significant because there was an embargo on uranium at this point. The Manhattan Project did not want any more uranium. Some had gone out to the Soviet Union against their will. They put an embargo on, and this uranium shipment, the reason the phone call went through, had to come through Canada. And when the General Groves, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, heard this, he didn't know this until these hearings in 1950 or so, he blew his top because he had put this embargo on specifically to prevent uranium from going to the Soviet Union. So this is what's going on. This is, so you're reading this, you're thinking, oh my gosh, was a rogue operation to help the Soviets develop the atomic, atomic expertise run out of the White House? Well, maybe so. I mean, this... I'll leave it to readers to, to determine, but this is the kind of story that has been lost to us that um, is very important. I remember getting very angry in terms of not finding <laughs> enough out about these, this evidence. I mean, this was testimony on the Hill and so forth. So this is the kind of lost history that American Betrayal sets out to reclaim. And in many ways, it sort of rewrites our understanding what we all know about World War II and the Cold War, uh, which is not what I set out to do in any way. And in fact, I grew up, my, my father, my own father was a veteran of World War II. He was a veteran of D-Day, um, D-Day plus two, the Normandy invasion. And so I grew up very proud of, uh, as, as all Americans are, of, of um, our war. And um, what I write in the book has nothing to do with the heroism and sacrifice of the American people. This is about what I find to be extremely corrupt leadership and extremely um, disturbing um, motivations and loyalties at the top and some of the more controversial claims that I end up working with or trying to assess, maybe, maybe D-Day wasn't necessary. That was where my father entered Europe. And maybe the Battle of the Bulge, which was the end, the big battle at the end of the European War, which my dad actually, um, he did not participate in. He would have, but he got very sick right before the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge began right just the Americans were over the line into Germany at the end of, of 1944. And my dad was there in his summer uniform from Normandy. And he actually got very ill. I think he probably had something close to pneumonia, very high fever, pulled off the line. And shortly after that, what became the Battle of the Bulge, the last German push in Europe, happened. And they suffered massive casualties where he, where he had been. So when I'm looking at this information, you know, it's not just as an American. I have a very personal stake in this, th these bookends of my dad's war. And the reason I say they might not have been necessary is there were attempts to bring the war to a close that I do believe were stopped due to communist penetration of our government. And I'd like to just speak of some of the numbers of what we're looking at here. We're not talking about one Aldrich Ames, the very famous spy who was busted back in the 90s, or five Cambridge spies. You may have heard of the Kim Philby ring, the Cambridge spies. Um, we're talking about hundreds of American traders secretly working for Moscow. Some of them got very close to the levers of power. Some of them got very close to making decisions, certainly to influencing decisions, to, to shaping decisions, to um, assisting certain personnel, got, making sure certain people got into positions of influence. It was, most of us always think of espionage as stealing secrets. You know, as, as finding out when the battle's going to start or what, what the, the secret formula is and passing it on to the enemy. And that's certainly what Hollywood dramatizes. But the more, I think, more per insidious and certainly probably the more dangerous form of espionage is influence. Shaping debate, conversation, making sure that so-and-so doesn't get through to the big boss or that so-and-so does, depending. And this is what I think is where we have to start looking at the accomplishments and the shaping of policy. And if we don't have one or five, but rather maybe 500, 500, about 500 have already been identified through these various um, releases of cables and releases of secret archives. I argue at a certain point, I mean, this is how it occurred to me. I'm reading this stuff. I'm putting it together. It's almost like a kind of occupation of Washington. If there's so many people, for example, a Harry Dexter White at the top of the Treasury with a whole coterie of, of helpers also secretly involved, Lachlan Curry, one of President Roosevelt's top aides, we know he was a Soviet agent, Harry Hopkins, we wonder about, again, in the White House, other people there. 
in the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA, riddled, riddled with agents. So you have to start thinking, is, is, is what we were doing dur during World War II truly an American strategy, or is it a very heavily Soviet-influenced strategy? So these are some of the, some of the um, terribly disturbing questions I'm trying to work with in the book. And using modern or our, our recently accessed archives, using um, declassified FBI files that are now available to us that were not before, um, using old memoirs that are totally lost to us, that are out of print, and you can easily find them online through these book search engines, which I used quite frequently and have a huge library now. Um, it's almost too easy to find a footnote to an old book, and you can usually order it for under $10, <laughs> and it's there, uh, which is great. But these are the kinds of things, State Department records, newspapers, I mean, you put it all together and you get a very different look at our past. And I'd just like to say something about um, our relationship with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union basically, from the point it came into being in 1917, basically was, had to, it openly declared war on the rest of the world, all the other systems. It wanted to communize everywhere. The world, I mean, nothing short of the world. It was a world conspiracy. I mean, people always say, oh, conspiracy theory. Well, the Soviet Union was one big conspiracy theory and one big conspiracy. It was secretly trying to subvert other countries. That's a conspiracy. People who tried to um, unmask them were unmasking these secret conspirators. We had um, four presidents and six secretaries of state who refused to recognize the Soviet Union because it was a revolutionary entity for the most part, and because you can't have normal relations with someone who wants to overthrow you, who wants to change your or get rid of your constitution. Now in 1933, November 16, we recognized, we normalized relations with the Soviet Union. This was under President Roosevelt. And I came to think of this date now as America's fall. And what I mean by that is, shortly before this, we, the world witnessed the, what is we often think of as now as the terror famine in the Ukraine. This was the forced starvation of some five, six million people, maybe more millions, by Stalin in the Ukraine, and then maybe six months later, we normalize relations. I mean, imagine, you have to scramble history a little, but imagine if in, say, in 1945, the end of the Holocaust comes, six million uh, Jews have been killed, and some country out there, a significant country, decides to recognize the Nazi government. I mean, of course, the Nazi government was gone, but I'm just saying, think about it just in terms of moral uh, parallels. It's unthinkable, it's unconscionable, and yet that is what we did in 1933. And it's not the case that this, this was not known to the world. The, you know, it certainly was not discussed in the terms or the spread of the news that it should have, but there was quite a lot of reporting that did get through. And this is something Robert Conquest, the great historian, has discussed. And um, it is uh, a moral stain. So this notion of recognizing this entity, knowing it had just committed this this crime against humanity, knowing that it was a revolutionary entity, we entered into this agreement based on a series of promises the Soviet Union made not to try to subvert our constitution. Literally, this is on the exchange of notes, not to support cadres of secret agents in our country designed to overthrow our country. I mean, this it was a series of lies that we signed in order to normalize relations. And the subtitle of my book, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character, actually comes from this, this relationship. This is what I'm talking about because I don't, of course, people lied before this time. We have the Ten Commandments tells us that we, you know, have been, man has been lying for forever and needs to stop. <laughs> but in terms of American institutions, in terms of our, our public people, our government as a policy, I don't think we see this before, and I think that this is something new on the American scene, and I think we see double standards rising from it. I think we see more lies running for it in a sense, as I mentioned in the beginning. The history does become a series of big lies. We have the big lie of recognition. Later during the war, we begin to lie with the Soviet Union. For example, the massacre of Polish officers or reservists at, the, at Katyn Forest, uh, 20,000 Polish officers were massacred by Stalin, and the atrocity was blamed on the Germans. We joined Stalin in blaming the Germans. The Germans discovered it and said, you know, not the, 
not to boost the Germans, but they did, the Nazis, but they did discover it, knew it was a Soviet crime, and told the world. We discovered, we, there was evidence at the time that was convincing, and yet we continually s took Stalin's side. This, to me, is another layer of sort of our, or another marker in our, in our moral decline. Later on, there are others. Um, for example, the worst one at this period would be at the end of the war, um, American and British troops assisted Stalin in repatriating some two million Soviet claim nationals who had fled the Soviet Union, were in Western Europe, and we forcibly returned them in something called Operation Keel Hall, which is a very, very little known episode of the war. We don't really read about it in our very triumphal history books. We participate, I see this as participating in this collusion with an evil, evil thing, um, and supported it in terms of silence, not talking about it. And so in other words, I'm seeing, as I'm looking at the, the, the progression of the book, more and more collusion. Um, this, I think, is, is you know, a terrible descent. And I think it partly starts to explain why it could be that we get to the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, and there's not all that much triumph uh, declared or, or elicited in, in the West. And I think that part of that has to do with this long period of appeasement, of collusion, and so in some ways sharing these terrible secrets of the Soviet Union with the Soviet Union. Um, so these are the kinds of um, issues I was dealing with. And again, coming across these great truth tellers who were trying at the time to unmask what was going on. And it's interesting to think back on what they went through. Um, the terrible names they were called, they were smeared in the media, they were maligned. Um, and I would just like to read you something I found very shocking from the memoir of Robert Stripling, who was the lead investigator, uh, the original investigator, on the House on American Activity, the House Committee on Ameri American Activities, which opened shop in 1938 under Representative Martin Dyes, who's another fabulous um, truth teller investigator we have in our past. And Stripling wrote his memoir, and I, I didn't know that much about what I was looking at yet. I was just beginning. I was shocked by this this timbre, and he this is how he explains what he's doing. He said. I want to tell in detail the price that men must pay for the dubious privilege of being reviled in print and on the air, for their labors in what amounts to a necessary sewer project of communist investigations. And he goes on to, to discuss what he's trying to do in this book. And he says, it's my attempt to outline without conjecture the scope of the communist conspiracy against the government and the people of the United States, even though to do so is to invite the charge of fascist red baiter, witch hunter, smear artist. To fail to do so is to capitulate to a resourceful enemy who can endure any counterattack except exposure. So again, we're coming back to this notion of hiding what's really going on versus these, these people who try to expose it. So we now have benefit of these archives. And just to just so you understand what I'm talking about, they're, they're after the fall of the Soviet Union, the archives in the Soviet Union, or now Russia, opened briefly, selectively. Scholars rushed in. I think they probably all realized this could not possibly last, and it seems like they were frenzied copying and looking, and, and it was a very chaotic kind of, of research. You didn't know what you would get when you asked for something. You didn't know if you'd find an old Stalinist library and he wouldn't even give it to you. It was kind of the Wild West in the library there. But we did come up with um, various archives, um, archival material. Uh, there was also the very famous Matrokin archive, which was a KGB archivist during the Soviet period, was copying all the time, hoping one day to get it out to the West, and he did. He got this out to us, the Matrokin archive. So these are KGB archives we have in America, which only comes out after we get some of these Soviet archives, which I think is very um, disturbing. I mean, why didn't America sh reveal these sooner? But in the mid-1990s, we have the Venona archive. That's an archive of copies of uh, intelligence cables that were going back from the Soviet embassy here back to the Soviet Union starting in 1939 
when the gov our government ordered Western Union just to make copies. They were coded, so they just stacked up. I mean, there were tens and th hundreds of thousands of them before it was over. During, this was in the war period. And in 1943, believe it or not, um, the reason that the American government started to decode them was in order to find out how we could possibly be better allies, how we could find out what they really wanted us to do. And in other words, it was, it was looked as, as a tool that might help us make them like us more. And the code breakers went to work and started realizing these aren't diplomatic cables, these are intelligence cables, and they're directing American networks of traders. And so this is the Venona archive. Um, we also have the declassified FBI files now, or some declassified, more declassified. So I'm looking at this work, and I'm realizing, you know, as we have this, this really intelligence um, library now, we have all these books and all these various archives reproduced, they're not entering the historical narrative. So this is why I am not a historian, I'm a journalist. This is why someone could come along at this late date after the thousands of books about World War II and the Cold War and actually have something new to do because this work has been developing kind of behind a brick wall. It has not been integrated into the narrative in any sort of systematic fashion. I would say there's a book that, that's come out, um, um, uh, the preceded mine um, came out at the end of last year by Stan Evans, whom some of you might have seen speak here before, Stalin's Secret Agents. This is exactly something that Mr. Evans was working with as well. Um, and, and indeed, I consider him a men uh, my mentor in, in all of this. But in terms of, aside from that, you do not find, if you go to the bookstore today and you look at any sort of biography from the mid-century war, war, war chronicle, stories about the wartime conferences, the Cold War, chances are, I mean, I would give you a quarter if you could find a book, except for Stanton Evans' book or mine, that actually is incorporating these findings. It is as if history continued along its way, and then all these findings about all these traitors working in our government are going off on this way. And it's very weird. When you lay them together is what you get and is why, at a certain point, I called the book American Betrayal. Now, in terms of modern application, again, I was coming at this through, kind of, I went down the rabbit hole on Islam and what we're dealing with today. And again, finding these uncanny parallels. Um, some of you may know that back in 2011, not that far back, uh, a couple years ago, um, we actually had a situation where 57 Muslim groups, including several Muslim Brotherhood fronts, US government identified Muslim Brotherhood front groups, approached uh, John Brennan, who was then President Obama's counterterrorism advisor, and several, uh, actually quite a list of, of cabinet and other high officials in the government, and demanded, demanded that training materials that they deemed anti-Islamic be purged, this is the word they used, from Department of Homeland Security, Justice Department, FBI, and so on, these kinds of security agencies, and that trainers that they also deemed anti-Islamic be fired or re-educated and disciplined, disciplined if they did not um, snap to and go through their, their proper re-education camp. I mean, you start thinking, where, are, where do we live? This essentially was done. This purge was completed. Um, the, the, the training materials, what little there was that could be deemed anti-Islamic, anti-Islamic in this way, actually meaning realistic in terms of teaching jihad, in terms of teaching about Islam um, in a way that's not an apologetic. These papers were actually removed. They then were classified, as, as I recall. Um, congressional members who were interested actually had to, you know, could not take staff in to see these purge documents. Um, this happened. We find a parallel in 1943, when you had the Soviet ambassador come to the State Department and give him a list of officials they deemed anti-Soviet, that they wanted purged. And they were purged. So again, you know, you're looking at this, kind of rubbing your eyes in disbelief. Um, so this makes me think we are, you know, we can learn from the ideological capitulation of the past. I think we are undergoing it again. But I also wonder, you know, we, we call the, we say that we won the other struggle, which I do not believe anymore. Are we going to then rewrite history in the next 20 years and say we won this struggle? I mean, it's a very, it's a very disturbing thing, and we see how narratives are set. Um, it was interesting for me to find that, that there were people who were onto this at the time. One of them was General Wiedemeyer, who's one of our leading strategists during World War II. And he wrote in his uh, 1958 memoir, he wrote the, Again, writing about this, looking back at the war period and what had happened, 
He said, the irony of it all is that the Soviet empire is largely one of our own creation. And I think he was right. And I think that we are looking at now even, we are looking sort of at this kind of ideological Soviet empire that took shape here, took root here, that grew here. And, and this is part of the reason that these lies are so hard to untell. It's so hard to pierce the silence. Um, I think if we go back to that kind of moral fall back in 1938, I'm 33, I'm sorry, with the recognition, I think that from this we see this loosening of our grasp on morality, on reality. Um, it's interesting to note that, that there was a book at, written after World War II called Great Mistakes of the War, which I thought was quite fascinating, because I, I, again, coming at it as a modern person, I did not know there were such things. I did not know we made great mistakes. The mistakes that this writer, who was a noted military correspondent named Hanson Baldwin, they talked about, he, he, they, they were ideological, or rather they were propaganda mistakes. W the first great mistake we made was that the Soviet Union had abandoned its policy of world revolution. Well, that's not a military problem. That is a propaganda problem. The second one, that Uncle Joe Stalin was a good fellow. Again, propaganda. If we are going on with Islam being a religion of peace, Islam compatible with democracy, I mean, these are similar kinds of propaganda that we are now dealing with. Um, looking at the state of penetration back then, at a certain point it occurred to me, we're not really looking at pro-Soviet propaganda, we were looking at Soviet propaganda. I mean, if there's so many people working on behalf of Moscow, there's no remove. Um, it, it's, it's, this is, the Office of War Information, for example, there was wartime censorship during World War II, riddled with communist agents. So again, this is how the, the, the mental conditioning was perpetrated. Um, these are the kinds of things we're finding today in terms of when we're told jihad is personal struggle, nothing to do with conquest, nothing to do with the caliphate. More in disinformation that we are also getting from the government. And what I cover in my day job, really, has to do with this kind of penetration, tracking Muslim Brotherhood fronts, their linkages in the government, personnel. In olden days, we had Al Jahis, this communist agent, working directly for Secretary of State Statinius. When Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, we had a woman named Huma Abedin working for her. The linkage between her and the Muslim Brotherhood is this close. There's no distance. Her family business was essentially started. Her parents have a magazine, a think tank in Saudi Arabia that she worked for for many years, along with, along with a man named Abdallah Omar Nassif, who is an al-Qaeda financier. He started Rabbit of Trust, which the US Treasury designated a foreign terrorist organization after 9-11. I mean, this person should never have gotten a security clearance to work for the Secretary of State this closely because of her ties to an al-Qaeda financier. I mean, it, it, it's, it's extraordinary. It is not covered. If anyone's watching the coverage of the New York mayoral campaign, her husband is Anthony Weiner. Their puff pieces galore about Huma Abedin. The media loves her. They never bring this up. Why? The context is gone, and this is something I saw again in the past. When you don't talk about the reality of Stalin or the reality of communism, someone who broaches it, whether it's a Joe McCarthy, whether it's a Dr. Wirt, they're treated as a pariah. It sounds so crazy. No one's talking about it, so someone does, and they're completely smeared as a crazy person. I think a media person today at a press conference with Anthony Weiner, even if he had the all of the information, which I could easily provide, <laughs> very simply, on Huma Abedin's um, very troubling links, they would feel embarrassed. And I think that this is part of, of how these things work. Again, these sorts of creations of influence, of, of um, disinformation, misinformation, and people just start not thinking about it and not talking about it. And then it disappears from the narrative. And I... Um, I think I would just close with saying that I, I had one interview, believe it or not, it was an internet radio show, so you have really very little constraints there. It, was, it went on for three hours. And at the end of it, I got an email very quickly. Someone who actually listened to all three hours, and someone wrote me and said, you know, you work on a book, it's over 400 pages, it has 961 footnotes or endnotes or something, but someone comes up with one sentence, and it, this, this man did. He said, essentially, if we boil this down, you are saying that all of post-1930 American World War II and Cold War history as it has been presented is a fiction. 
Yes, essentially, that is kind of the message I guess I'm putting over here. Um, and again, trying to understand why it's so hard to untell these lies. We have pushed back up from the left to this day. They do not want to hear anything bad about Roosevelt and the socialist world he created, our socialist system. We never say that word, but what is Obamacare but socialized medicine? Um, we cannot talk about that. We don't want to unravel Roosevelt world. Also, the establishment um, on the right has a lot, a lot of appeasement to explain, a lot of collusion, a lot of silence. And again, this is something I think that plays into the fact that we live with these narratives. No one wants to change them. Um, Stanton Evans, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he wrote a book about Joseph McCarthy, a real just retelling of the story based on primary documents. Uh, called Blacklisted by History, and I, he was very kind to me. I met him while I was researching this book, and he was very helpful with his time, and he said to me once, while I was doing this research, he said, when you read a document that, when you or rather, when you come back to a document that you read early in your research, it will always look different. You will always learn more. You will always see things differently when you come back to your, your primary sources. You will understand them differently. I'd like to just close with a, something that this happened to me with. It wasn't a document, but it was an anecdote by the former or the former Soviet dissident, the, the, dis the uh, Vladimir Bukovsky, who spent um, many years being tortured in a psychiatric hospital at the end of the Soviet Union. He wrote a piece about, um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the first Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, sent him into the archive in order to um, uh, put together a, a case against communism, like a Nuremberg trial, to put the system on trial. And while Bukowski was, he went in also copying, 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 because he knew too that, that the archives would shut one day as they did. He brought out a tremendous archive of his own. Um, but he, at a certain point, Yeltsin called him off and said, we're not gonna be doing this. We're not gonna try communism. And, and Bukowski said, why? And he said, I'm getting too much pressure from the West. He was getting pressure from Western governments, do not try communism a la Nuremberg. And when I first read that, I, I could not understand it. But after the research, I do, again, going back to this notion of collusion, silence, appeasement, and so on, and again, manipulation of this narrative that now becomes something more important than reality, morality. Um, Solzhenitsyn, in evident frustration, wrote, it is as if the West actually does not want to know the truth until the moment when this knowledge has ceased to be of use. It's, it's, it's a terrible thought. It seems quite apt. I hope he's wrong. Um, I'm hoping we can learn from these truths. I think they are, they are vital, even when they break our hearts, because this, this is a very heartbreaking book in many ways. Um, I think they do show us the deception our government has put over on us, and and can be putting, is putting over us again, shows the value of the truth tellers, the importance of not running away from the truth, um, and how we can perhaps be able to be armed with what we need to know to prevent it from happening again. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.